In today's khutbah, I'd like to share with you that the purpose of these few minutes that I have with you is to try and share some lessons about one single prayer that Allah teaches us in the Qur'an and of the ayat that I recited from the 17th surah, Surah Al-Isra, that was the last of them. وَقُلْ رَبِّي أَدْخِلْنِي مُدْخَلَ صِدْقٍ وَأَخْرِجْنِي مُخْرَجَ صِدْقٍ وَجْعَلْنِي مِنْ لَدُنْكَ سُلْطَانَ النَّصِيرَ It's a very powerful and beautiful prayer that can benefit believers throughout their lives. But the purpose of this khutbah is to get to that prayer by the end. I want to give you some background and some history that you can appreciate where this prayer came from and how it benefited first and foremost our Messenger wasallam, and by extension it benefits all of us. Because the first thing the, the, that the Muslims understand, believers understand, is the purpose of prayer is that they connect with their, their master and their master helps them through their prayer. All of our prayers in one way or the other, every single supplication that we have in one way or the other benefits us in our life in some way. It helps us in some way. So I want to begin with this surah, the beginning of this surah. This surah starts with a very unique incident in the life of our Prophet ﷺ, where he was taken by the angel uh, from the city of Mecca through a divine journey all the way to Jerusalem. And then he, was, he prayed there and then he was taken up a journey in the seventh heavens and was brought back to Mecca all in the course of what we consider in the worldly, in the worldly sense not even a matter of a second but what took an elaborate amount of time for him because time, the way it works in this world is not the way it works in the unseen. So when this journey was told about, when the Prophet ﷺ described to the companions that he had gone on this night journey, the Arabic word for a night journey being Isra, and that's the first ayah, Subhanallah asra bi abdihi laylan, the, how perfect is the one who took his slave in the middle of the night for that journey. That's how the surah begins. So when he describes this journey, of course, believers like Abu Bakr al-Siddiq are immediately confirming that that is what happened. As unbelievable as it sounds, that in the middle of the night, this man traveled from here, from Mecca to Jerusalem, up the seventh heavens, and then back, and met all of these previous prophets, and prayed with them, and saw all these scenes of the afterlife, and then came back. All of it sounded so unbelievable, it became a joke to those who disbelieved. It actually became something to mock and to make fun of, across Mecca for everybody else. They would even come to the Muslims and say, you really believe he did that? You seriously believe he traveled on some, some flying horse and went all the way to Jerusalem and then he went up, up the skies and did intergalactic travel? You really honestly believe that this man, when he even says that? And believers would say, yes, we do. Yes, we do. They, they wouldn't have any doubt about it. They, their faith was unshaken. Why? Because the foundation of this faith, this is not the foundation of their faith. The foundation of their faith was already laid. They had already been convinced that this Qur'an is the word of God, it's the word of Allah. And this is the messenger of Allah. And once they believed that, they understood what Allah is capable of. And when Allah can do something for, you know, for us, what He will do for us in our afterlife is much more remarkable. When He will resurrect all human beings from their graves. So what is, how hard is it for them to believe that Allah will take His messenger on a journey like that one? In any case, this is also a surah around the time when things were getting very difficult for the Prophet and for the companions. Not only were they being ridiculed, by this time now, things were getting physical. So Muslims were now starting to get tortured, beat, threatened. There were even plans to either kill the Prophet ﷺ, or at the very least expel him from Mecca. وَإِن كَادُوا لَيَسْتَفِزُونَكَ مِنَ الْأَرْضِ لِيُخْرِجُوكَ مِنْهَا, ليخرجوكَ منها. So they can kick you out of the land, they want to terrorize you, instill fear in you. This is what Allah is commenting on in this surah as well. So in light of these things, what I wanted to share with you is that when Allah took His Messenger to Jerusalem and He said Himself, لِنُرِيَهُ min ayatina," So we could show Him our miraculous signs. Allah wants Him to ponder over the history of Jerusalem. But our Prophet Muhammad wasallam is not a historian of Jewish history. He doesn't know a lot about their tradition. He doesn't know a lot about that region except for Allah will reveal to him. So what does Allah reveal to him in this surah? He tells him that they used to be, this used to be the house of Allah, the masjid, and this was actually violated a couple of times. And the people were expelled, and they were taken as slaves. And this is talked about in the very beginning. This is important for the Prophet to learn at this time, sallallahu alayhi wa because he's also on the verge of being expelled from Makkah. So now he's going to learn about a history of people that were expelled from the house of worship and the masjid was even destroyed. Alhamdulillah, the Kaaba was not destroyed, but it was certainly violated. It was you know, surrounded by idols and its legacy was certainly tarnished. And then the Prophet is being told on this journey that this journey first of all should tell you that what you're going through is not something new. This has happened before. This is a legacy of Allah with Prophets. 
And you're supposed to be a part of that legacy. So don't be saddened by what is about to come. This is the first thing that connects these two legacies together. The second is, when you travel from this earth to all the way to the seventh heaven, then leaving the city of Mecca to travel to the city of Medina is not going to be a big deal anymore. <laughs> it's going to be easy for you to handle that this is not a long journey. We can, we can do this. Allah, if Allah can guard me and safeguard me through that incredible journey, then this other journey that's on the horizon is not going to be a big deal. So now Allah Azza wa Jalla says, and even if they did kick you out, even if the people of Mecca did expel you, even if they did get you out, they're not going to stay behind you and stay in power for much longer. In other words, even if I let you go, and even if you leave the city of Mecca, it's pretty soon that you're going to be coming back. It's pretty soon that you're going to get victory again, which was completely unimaginable for Muslims who had no authority, no control, absolutely no respect in that society. They were the object of ridicule everywhere they turned. They themselves are taking the beatings and now they're being told, oh, don't worry, if you get kicked out of Mecca, you'll be coming back because they're not going to last. These Meccans that are in control, they're not going to last. SubhanAllah. This is the picture that's painted for our Prophet wasallam. But then in the middle of all of this, the subject changes. And this is where things get really interesting. The subject almost becomes a completely different one. How do you prepare for a journey? How do you prepare for a different transition? This is the most difficult, one of the most difficult moments in the Prophet's life وسلم, Despite the counsel that Allah has given him, our messenger had a lot of love for the Kaaba. He had a lot of love for the Kaaba because it was built by his father Ibrahim. Abraham. And he knew, he recognized that. So his affinity to that house was much stronger than, you know, for anybody to leave their home and leave their homeland and the place of their birth is difficult. But for our Prophet, there were these this line, the reasons of lineage, but also spiritual reasons for him not to want to leave. And so even before, a lot of people don't know this, but even before we were commanded to pray in the direction of the Kaaba, the Muslims were actually instructed to pray in the direction of Jerusalem. We were supposed to pray towards Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. So what the Prophet used to do while he resided in Mecca, is he used to, because you could go any way, any direction you want around the Kaaba, so he used to align himself in a way, so he's praying with the Kaaba in front of him, and Jerusalem is lined up. So he would be able to do that. So he'd be able to show respect to the house that his father Abraham built, and also, السلام, and also be able to abide by the regulations of prayer that still hadn't changed, we still prayed in the direction of Jerusalem, right? Which by the way also teaches you and me the importance of the Prophet going to that masjid Because that was the original Qibla So he's actually going, you could say in a sense it's a Umrah That was assigned by Allah for him to do because that's the original Qibla You know, before this one, at least in the seerah of the Prophet Now the Prophet's gonna migrate to Medina But when he migrates to Medina and if he wants, because he has to face Jerusalem again to pray But this time if he's gonna face Jerusalem, his back is gonna be to Makkah he can't line both of them up together anymore. Because Medina is on the way to Jerusalem. So you're, if you're going to face it, you're gonna, you're, your back is going to have to be towards Mecca. And that hurts his feelings. Even the fact that there are narrations about the Prophet ﷺ turning to the Kaaba and crying and talking to it as he's leaving. Like a mother. Like a mother that he's parting from. ﷺ. This is a very, very painful journey for the Prophet. But you know, and not only is it a painful journey, you should all know that this is also a dangerous journey. There are scouts from Mecca that are ready to, whose only assignment is to trace his steps, find him and kill him. That's their job. They know that there's a, he's planning an escape, or this is the night that's come, or they're, they're thinking he might have escaped, and they're gonna scout him out and find him and kill him. And it got to the point where they were almost killed. That's going to be described much later on in the Qur'an, in Surah Surah Tawbah that was revealed much later, when the scouts were virtually at their feet. And they're literally in a ditch in the ground, it's night time, so it's, it's just a matter of these guys looking down. If they look down, they'll find the Prophet and Abu Bakr hiding. They could see them. And that's the point where the Prophet was you know, given revelation. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq was worried, and he said, the Prophet turned to him and said, لا تحزن إن الله معنا Don't be sad, Allah is with us. It's amazing that and even at that point, he didn't say, don't be afraid, Allah is with us. He said, don't be sad, Allah is with us. Abu Bakr wasn't afraid. He was just sad that if this happens, the truth will die here. The truth will no longer spread. That was a sadness that was killing him, not the fear of death. So no, no, no reason to say, لا تخف إن الله معنا, but rather, لا تحزن إن الله معنا. You know, don't be sad, Allah is with us. But in any case, this journey is going to be an extremely difficult one. It's an extremely sad one. It's an extremely painful one. 
And in considering all of that, now Allah is going to give the Prophet ﷺ the proper provisions. How are you supposed to prepare for this journey? You know, this is something Allah does all the time. When you prepare for a difficult journey, He gives instruction. For example, when we go to Hajj, Allah says, When you're going to go to Hajj, which is a tough journey, Allah says, make sure you take precautions. Make sure you pack properly. Make sure you have your passport in order. Make sure you have enough savings. Make sure you take a safe road. Make sure you don't talk to strangers. All of that's captured inside tazawwadu. فَإِنَّ خَيْرَ زَادِ التَّقْوَى And the best of all provisions you can have is your consciousness of Allah and caution when you travel. Be careful when you travel. This is what Allah says when you travel. So how is Allah going to prepare the Prophet ﷺ for this journey? What does He say? You'd be surprised. He says, أَقِمِ الصَّلَاةَ لِدُلُوكِ الشَّمْسِ إِلَىٰ غَسَقِ اللَّيْلِ وَقُرْآنَ الْفَجْرِ He says, establish the prayer from the time the sun comes up to the time the night becomes really deep and dark and especially the Qur'an of Fajr. The Qur'an of the Fajr prayer. You want to prepare for this journey? Pray. You want to prepare for this journey? And the Prophet's already committed to prayer. It's not like this ayah came and now he started praying. It's now he's being told, in order to, to be, now you're going to be disconnected from your people. You're going to be disconnected from your motherland. This land that you're going to be leaving. But you know what? One connection will remain. And that connection has to be strengthened like never before. That's the connection with Allah. And of that ultimate connection, by the way, the Arabic word for connection is salah. From sila. Salah, which is prayer itself. And so Allah is telling him, no matter how much you get severed from this place, you will never get severed from Allah. And of all those prayers, those five prayers, the one that will truly connect you to Allah is going to be the, the Qur'an of Fajr. He didn't even call it the prayer of Fajr. Notice he called it the Qur'an of Fajr. Qur, Qur'an al-Fajr. Actually, Qur'an is not made idafa of, for Arabic students, it's not made idafa of to, other than to, to uh, al-Fajr. It's incredible. The word Qur'an in the Qur'an is never connected to anything in it the way it is to the word al-Fajr. It's a, it's a remarkable thing. So Allah is telling our Messenger وسلم, especially that break of dawn, when, when darkness ends and light begins, at that time, that is the time to recite the Qur'an. Why is that significant? For many reasons, in this khutbah I'll share a couple of them with you. You know the era between the, the, the departure of Jesus, of Isa السلام, and the coming of our Prophet وسلم, is this long period of darkness. It's like a night. And then finally the light of revelation came, which is like the morning. That's like the morning. The Qur'an recited at Fajr is actually, it symbolizes the end of the age of darkness and the beginning of revelation. The Prophet ﷺ is being told, even if you're going through most, the most darkest of times, the humanity was in much darker times and this Qur'an came. So don't worry, when you commit to the Qur'an at Fajr time, no matter what dark times you're going through, light is on the horizon. Just like the light of the sun comes out, it is the light of revelation that will brighten your, the rest of your life, the rest of your day. Qur'an al-Fajr. What an incredible statement for the Prophet ﷺ. Don't be depressed, brighter days are ahead. Brightness is ahead. And the best way to prepare is Qur'an al-Fajr. He says, Inna Qur'an al-Fajr kana mashhuda. The Qur'an of fajr is, has always been witnessed. Now the question is, who is witnessing it? Kana mashhuda has always been witnessed. And this is an issue of Ma'ud, which suggests that there are those that are witnessing it, but the witnesses aren't mentioned. You know what that means? Allah is especially witness to the Quran recited at Fajr. He's also mentioning that there are angels whose only task is to witness the Quran recited at Fajr. So Imam Razi would go on to say, but in this ayah there's also an indication that believers should encourage each other to pray Fajr together so they can witness each other. So they can be, you know, each of you becomes mashhud for the rest. You become washahidin wa mashhud. That's what happens. So this idea of the Qur'an preparing you at Fajr time, preparing you for the migration that's coming. And then he says, for the Prophet himself particularly, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَمِنَ اللَّيْلِ فَتَهَجَّدْ بِهِ نَافِلَةً لَكَ And from in the middle of the night, some part of the night, make sure that you particularly make tahajjud, additional night prayers. Additional for you. نَافِلَةً لَكَ Telling the Prophet. Why? Because when his followers would hear that, they might think that this is mandatory on them. So Allah made it clear immediately. No, no, نَافِلَةً لَكَ It's additional for you. An extra thing for you. Not for them. 
I've given you an extra half. So some would even extrapolate from this that the night prayer, the additional prayer after Isha and before Fajr is actually mandatory for the Prophet. An additional responsibility on him, not on us. We're encouraged to do so, but he's obligated to do so. Why? And Allah tells us why. He says, Asa an yab'athaka rabbuka maqaman mahmuda. Perhaps my, your, your master is going to raise you and elevate you to a place, a station that is praised. Maqaman mahmuda. I have a few minutes left, but I gotta get this out to you somehow. The Prophet ﷺ is being told that if you pray in the middle of the night, there's, a, there's an optimistic chance that you are going to be placed on a praiseworthy station. Maqamam Mahmuda. This is not an accidental term. What does it mean, a praiseworthy station? The Prophet himself would describe al Maqamul Mahmud, the place that is praised. It is a reference to something that will happen on the Day of Judgment. On the Day of Judgment, all humanity will be gathered. يَوْمَ نَدْعُوا كُلَّ أُنَاسٍ بِإِمَامِهِمْ No accident, that ayah is also in this surah. When we call all people by their leaders, and this ummah, these Muslims, are gonna be called by their leader, the Prophet ﷺ. Nobody will be speaking on that day. لا يتكلمون إلا من أذن له الرحمن Nobody will say a word, except the one who Allah gives, per, the, you know, Ar-Rahman gives permission to. Allah gives permission to. And the only one He gives permission to on Judgment Day, is the Prophet ﷺ. Humanity, all of it, the sea of humanity is in one field, and one man starts elevating above the rest. And everybody can see this one man rising. And then he's given permission to sleep, speak. And then he says, I will praise Allah with words of praise that I don't even know yet. That Allah will give me then that no one's ever heard before. And that's how the Prophet will start speaking to Allah on Judgment Day. That is the station worthy of praise. But of the things he will say on that day, I wanted to share this with you in particular. فَيَقُولُ The Prophet will say, لَبَّيْكْ وَسَعْدَيْكْ You know, لَبَّيْكْ, here I am. And how happy I am to see you. وَالشَّرُّ لَيْسَ إِلَيْكْ And no evil can be attributed to you. وَالْمَهْدِيُّ مَنْ هَدَيْتْ And the one you've guided truly has been guided. وَعَبْدُكَ بَيْنَ يَدَيْكَ And your slave is right here before you. He's talking about himself. وَبِكَ And he's only here because of you. وَإِلَيْكْ And he was always headed towards you anyway. وَلَا مَلْجَأَ وَلَا مَنْجَمْ مِنْكَ إِلَّا إِلَيْكَ And there is no place to hide. No, no ditch to find refuge in. And no refuge and no rescue from you except to you. تَبَارَكْتَ وَتَعَالَيْتَ How blessed you are, how high and, uh, and sacred you are. Subhanaka, how perfect you are. And the last part of this really gets me. رَبَّ الْبَيْتِ He calls Allah, instead of calling him master, he says, master of the house. He calls him master of the house. Where is the Prophet going to leave? He's going to be leaving Mecca, which is the house of Allah. And Allah says, pray Fajr time, and then pray in the middle of the night, and maybe Allah will raise you to this high praiseworthy place. And when he's raised on that high worthy place, he will turn to Allah and call him the master of the house. But when he calls him the master of the house, they're no longer at the Kaaba. They're no longer at the Kaaba. Allah is, Rabb al-Bayt here is a reference to the, the Arsh of Allah. It's the throne of Allah. It's the, it's the grand, you know, kingdom of Allah in the heavens that is above the Kaaba. What Allah is saying is, you're worried about departing from this house of Allah to Medina. I'm preparing you to see me by my arsh. Rabb al-Bayt. Don't worry about this journey. I've got a much bigger journey for you ready. Prepare for that one instead. And this one will become easy. What an incredible thing to say, subhanAllah. This is what the Messenger وسلم, was given as a preparation and then the prayer that was the point of this khutbah. The prayer is waqul and say. Now that you've prepared yourself, now ask Allah. Ask Allah, Rabbi adkhilni mudkhala sidqin. Master, enter me. Allow me to enter. Put me in. Mudkhala sidqin. A place to enter truthfully. Mudkhala sidq is a difficult thing to express. I'll try to communicate some of its meanings to you guys. Everybody move up, inshallah. I can ask you to move up. Mudkhala Sidqin suggests, Ya Allah, wherever you make me enter, make sure I don't let go of the truth. Make sure the truth is by my side. Sidq in Arabic also is the opposite, not just of kadib, of lie, but also of su, of evil. Ya Allah, wherever you make me enter, whatever you put me in, put me in in a way that is good. Put me somewhere that's good for me. Put me around people that accept my truth. Make me truthful to others, keep me truthful to others, and allow others to be truthful to me. Mudkhala Sidqin, surround me with sincerity. 
Ya Allah, enter me there. Mudkhala sidqin. Wa akhrijni and take me out. Mukhraja sidqin. Take me out from wherever you're going to take me out. But take me out while I can hold on to goodness. And be true. And be sincere. Now it's interesting that uh, this entire scene was about the Prophet not entering somewhere, but leaving somewhere. He was leaving Mecca. He was leaving Mecca. So that you were ex I was expecting Allah to say, وَقُلْ رَبِّ أَخْرِجْنِي مُخْرَجَ سِدْقٍ Ya Allah, get me out of here in a way that's true, you know, I can hold on to the truth. And in a way that's good for me. But instead of talking about him exiting, Allah talks about him entering first. What Allah is teaching us in this ayah is profound. Scholars, like, when I started trying to understand how people have in the past have contemplated over this prayer, and what they thought about this prayer, I was baffled. I was absolutely baffled. Some said, this prayer, get, you know, enter me into a truthful place is Medina. Get me out of a place truthfully, that's Makkah. That's one interpretation. Another group said, no, no, no. Actually, get me out of a truth, or enter me into a place is actually his return into Makkah. His return into Makkah. And then, get me out, truthfully, is his departure from this world. Some said, adkhilni, enter me into the grave. With, so that I'm, I'm a truthful person. Adkhilni, adkhilni fil qabr, mudkhala sidqin. Wa akhrijni min al qabr, mukhraja sidqin. Get me out of the grave. And all of these interpretations hold true. But you know why you have so many interpretations? Because Allah did not limit this prayer to the migration of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, And that's the wisdom of Allah. Every one of you and every one of myself, my family, you, your families, every human being is either in a situation or getting out of a situation. We are in the middle of something, and we're hoping to get out of something. Or we're, tr you know, and, and Allah Azza wa is telling us something remarkable in this prayer. If you want to get out in a way that you can hold on to the truth, and, and get out in a way that's good for you, then first of all, hold on to your prayers. Hold on to your prayers. And especially take care of Fajr prayer. And if you really want to end up in a place that's praiseworthy, add the night prayer. That's an extra thing. But then when you do, then what Allah will do for any, anything you find, your, any trouble you find yourself in, you don't worry about Allah getting you out of trouble. It's actually Allah saying, I'm going to get you into something good. Into something good. I hope I can co communicate this clearly to you as I am my khutbah. The, the beauty of this dua. When a human being is in trouble, when you and I are in trouble, all we can think about is when is it going to end? When am I going to get out of this mess? That's all we can think about. Allah in His wisdom is giving us a prayer that doesn't just get us out of the mess. Before He makes you worry about get out of the mess, Allah is saying, pray that I put you in something good first. And by the way, get you out of the mess. Adkhildi mudkhala sidqin first. Akhrijni mukhraja sidqin second. Because it could be that you get out of this mess into a much bigger mess. <laughs> That's what we do with our lives. So before you worry about getting out of this trouble, Allah is asking you to beg Him to put you in something that is good for you. That, it, that you can hold on to your sincerity and your truth. And now we're learning, in no matter what situation we find ourselves in, no matter what difficulty we find ourselves in, the thing to ask Allah is that our character, our integrity, our truthfulness is not compromised. So long as that is not compromised, whatever Allah puts us in is fine. And so the last part of this prayer, وَجَعَلْنِي مِنْ لَدُنْكَ سُلْطَانًا نَصِيرًا And put in, uh, uh, furnish for me, provide for me, something that especially comes from you and can only come from you, مِنْ لَدُنْكَ And that can only come from your special vaults. This is لَدُنْ, the Arabic word. Like something that can only and only come from Allah, and it's particularly catered for you, it's not meant for anybody else. What is this thing? سُلْطَانًا نَصِيرًا a, a, an aiding authority. Now what does that mean? That actually means, Ya Allah, give me confidence in what I do. Sultan in Arabic could mean authority, power, give me the strength to be able to deal from one situation to another, that will aid me. But also Sultan means evidence. Inna ibadi laysa laka alayhim Sultan means saytara on the one hand. Sultanun mubin in the Quran, clear burhanun mubin, bima'na burhanun mubin. Clear evidence, Ya Allah, whatever I do, give me clarity. Give me clarity that will help me. Make me think clearly through things. So when I do things, I don't do them haphazardly. You know why that's so wise? Because when we are in a state of desperation, when human beings are in trouble, then they make decisions without thinking through things. They, think, they don't think, they just act out of emotion. And then they regret their decision later. 
So you pray to Allah, first of all, don't compromise my integrity no matter what the situation. And second of all, Ya Allah, whatever I do, please furnish me the ability to take authoritative, well thought out decisions that, will only going, that are only going to aid me. وَجْعَلِّي مِنْ لَدُنْكَ سُلْطَانًا نَصِيرًا And so you appreciate what Allah says in the next ayah as I conclude, وَقُلْ جَاءَ الْحَقِّ وَزَهَقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَهُوقًا And just declare after that, that the truth has arrived, and falsehood has dissipated. It's withered away. When you can do that, then don't worry about any falsehood that comes in your life. Anybody who gives you trouble. All of that will disappear if you can commit yourself to Allah. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us of those who can truly hold on to Him and become of those. All of us falter. All of, the, all of us have weaknesses. Some of us have very bad sleep habits. We don't get up for Fajr. Or we barely get up for Fajr. Or we, even when we're praying Fajr, we're still sleeping. That happens too, you know. May Allah make us of those who can better our sleeping habits and take advantage of the Qur'an of Fajr that can be witnessed, that can become our aid. And then one day we can additionally even stand in the middle of the night before Allah so He can take us out of whatever situation we're in and put us in a mudkhal sidq. He can put us in a place that is, that is good for us, it's true for us, and it strengthens our own truthfulness. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayat wa dhikr al-Hakim.